dance is a good move. Why you dancing? Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. You who running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am usually watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode. But today, we are celebrating Aqua Teen's new little brother, Postocalypse. Postocalypse is Aqua Teen co creator Matt Malero's new film, and it is out for free on Tubi. Link in the description. I'm excited to say in this episode, we are joined by Matt, Postocalypse's mom himself, who done birthed the film right out of his head. So as you can imagine, I am very, very excited to share this conversation with you. Of course, Matt wasn't the only one from Aqua Teen involved in Postocalypse. We have Dana Snyder playing leading man Alfredo Manicotti. We have Aqua Teen OG animators Craig Harton and Matt Jenkins on this. Aqua Teen's longtime editor, Phil Sampson, the list goes on. At first, while watching Postocalypse, I was surprised by how much I was enjoying it, until I remembered it's made by a bunch of Aqua Teen guys, at which point I felt dumb because obviously it's going to be a good time. But outside of our typical Aqua Teen crew, there is just some insane talent on this one, such as SNL and Plantasm alum Lauren Holt, who kills it as Emma Manicotti, Unbelievable Ron himself, Lavelle Crawford, is back in the mix as the hilarious character Chubb. And for the 12-ounce mouse fans, Mary Spender, she found time to put down the guitar and pick up the microphone to play a major character on this one. Uh, her name escapes me. I think her name is like Mari or Mori or, or something like that. The cast here is just awesome. Shoutouts to Jess Arnell, William Sanderson. There's just so many great voices on this thing. Postocalypse is such an enjoyable movie, and if you haven't seen it yet, you a damn fool. Matt and I get into all sorts of stuff here, from the conception of Postocalypse, which actually dates back to 2016, how writing Postocalypse solo differed from writing Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm with Dave Willis, we talk about the band Anchor and their incredible end credits song on this film, and we also talk about how Fox may be becoming the new Adult Swim, I don't know, you'll, you'll hear it in here. We also get into some more serious subjects, such as Matt's biggest disappointment with the film, as well as Tubi's lack of promotion on the film. I mean, if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you'll know I went on for a couple months like, yeah, the film's coming out. Uh, there's nothing out about it yet, but Matt's telling me it's coming out. So uh, we get into that here. A couple other topics that we get into include Matt's recent pilot on Adult Swim called Yenor, which was made with Adult Swim OG Jim Fortier. You know him from Space Ghost, Brack Show, Squidbillies, a bunch of stuff. We revisit Matt's series Nunderworld that he told us about the last time he was on the podcast. And you know I'm asking Matt about the upcoming Aqua Teen season. He even drops a few high-profile names we can expect to see in those episodes when they come out. So get ready for it. And as a sweet little bonus, at the very end of the episode, stick around to hear about how Matt got kicked out of ACDC's base camp at Download Festival. Before we get into it, though, I want to mention my recent interview with Bento Box GM and Postocalypse producer Craig Harton. Uh, Craig and I spoke about the production behind Postocalypse last month, so check that interview out if you want to hear more about what went into the film pertaining to the animation and production. There are timestamps on that episode, so you can jump right to that if that's what you want. I definitely would suggest it. So with all of that having been said, here it is, my conversation with Postocalypse writer and director. That's right. I know what I said. Matt Malero. Well, all right. I guess, uh, first of all, congratulations on the new film, Postocalypse. It was very good. And Thanks. So I guess I'm, I'm really fascinated by the origin story of this film. So my understanding is you had the idea, just more so the title written, you said in an interview with uh, Bubble Blabber. Yeah. You had the idea back in 2016. You had it kind of just written down. And then as you told me when we talked in December that you like were on this call with uh, some representatives from Tubi uh, with with the guys at, at Bento Box and you just pitched it like you had this vague idea. They loved it, but you didn't have a script yet. True. 
how was that for you? Was that stressful? Because like it's like they signed it on. It sounded like before the script was done or anything. So were you stressed out or not really? No, I wasn't stressed out at all because it was such a ridiculous. First of all, it did start out as just a title. Like I had notes and there had titles and concepts and just you know idea things and and uh, then I started kind of hammering out what may or may not work for this sort of title as a movie. And then when I talked to Fox, it was literally just. Hey, Bento Box called and said, we're going to get on the phone with Fox and they're just going to talk to you about what they want to do with Tubi. And I was like, well, I don't really have anything to pitch right now. Like, like full on there. No, no, we're not pitching anything. Okay. Okay. So we get on and uh, it's Bento Box, like three of them. And then it was just Fox. There was no Tubi, but they owned it, Tubi. And, and I know both of them, um, Daniel Weidenfeld and Ola was and uh and they're like 10 minutes talking about, well, we want to do this, this, and this, we want to make a few movies. and and then they stopped their spiel and then Bento wasn't saying, nobody was saying anything. <laughs> so I just started going, <laughs> what if noodles came to life and it wreaked havoc on the world and it's called Postocalypse. And I was like, I was kind of like rolling through, I, I mean, I was just making it up on the spot because I really had nothing. But whatever I was saying made them just giggle and laugh so much that honestly, they called the next day and said, we really want to make Postocalypse mm-hmm. and we're going to do a two picture deal with you. And we may want the sequel. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I, honestly, at that point, it was just, it was such a just, uh, I mean, it's it's such a silly idea. And then I wasn't stressed out about coming up with a story at all because I was like, well, I'm just going to approach this like I could do all my stuff and just start coming up with something. Um, so I did. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you, the first iteration of this movie, the first outline was more of an action-driven, just Mad Max meets uh, John Wick. and I was trying to take it real seriously. I thought if I take this real seriously, but it's so stupid, <laughs> maybe that'll <laughs> maybe that'll work. Right. Um, and I really did like that one, but then Fox was like, "Yeah, we really want to lean more towards what you already do." So I was like, okay. I'm just going to approach this like uh, like Aqua Team. So that's how that kind of came about. And and then the second the second outline went in, and and uh, they were really liking it. You know, and it's like they just had general comments and thoughts, and I just shaped it and. Then, and uh, from there, it took off as, into a script, and then the, we made the film. Right. Well, for you, do you wish you could have stuck with that original iteration of more of like an action with comedy on the side, or or are you are you glad that you pivoted more towards a comedy? No, I think I, I I like what I have now. I think I think the other one would have worked as well, but I think this one ultimately is the best one for people who like to look at stuff I make. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like it kind of it kind of hits that nerve. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I'm actually happier that it went this direction. You wrote the film by yourself then completely, is that correct? That is correct. So how is it for you writing something yourself versus, say, something with Dave? What are some of the pros and cons of that? Well, I t- you know, when I work with on Aqua Team with Dave, you know, we, it, it just more different things are brought to the table from his perspective and mine. And that's what makes that show so great. And also, Dave and I don't, we don't really have a lot of stuff in common when it comes to music and, and, you know, things like that. And, and so I think that is what makes that show so rich. And then it, it is different. I felt like I was in a vacuum writing this thing and I'd bounce ideas off my wife and my kids. And <laughs> at one point I didn't know how to end it. And I was driving my kids. So I'm like, this is what happens. And how, how should I end this thing? Cause they're big into like comedies and action. And, and we kicked around some might. so, yeah, it's a little, so all you do is you sit around hoping that I'm in my office at night writing stuff down. I'm like, I'm, well, I'm liking this. I think this is working. And uh, and then you don't know anything until you send it out and they call you back and say, hey, <laughs> we like this part of it. Can you make this a little whatever? And so, yeah, it's it's definitely, uh, it's fun, though. It's still fun to do it. Um, right. It's just a different, totally different um, way of doing it. Mm-hmm. So it's great to bounce ideas off with other people. But then all we all all I can bounce ideas off right now are my guitars. You don't talk back. <laughs> I just have to <laughs> just have to roll with what I think is working. And and plus, I also know I want to bring this up too because I can't say enough about the cast. But mm-hmm. I picked people that I worked with before who I knew were going to bring more to the table for this movie than what I had written down. Mm. And I think that helped a ton. I mean, I know it helped a ton. <laughs> well, so like on Aquatine, you 
you coach the voice actors. You're a part of that process. I assume it was the same for Postocalypse. You were with them while they were recording. Oh yeah, I directed them. I directed every single one of them. And um, yeah, and we it was same approach with Aqua Team. We just kind of rolled. You know, we feel free to ad lib. What would you say here? Let's get the line. Let's change this word. I mean, it was just a. It was so much fun to do, and they all really brought a lot to the table. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you have uh, most notably from your other work, Dana Snyder, uh, playing one of the main characters. And I guess this is my ignorance from somebody outside of the television film industry. But I didn't know about that until I interviewed Craig Harton like a few days before the film came out. So like, why why wasn't that in the promotional material more that Dana Snyder was doing one of the main characters? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, it was really a, it's a mystery. Um, I'm still going through it even today. I feel like, I feel like they really dropped the ball on promoting this thing. Yeah, I really do. I mean, there was basically no promotion except they did. There, yeah, there was like, none. there was no like, here it comes. It's coming soon. I mean, my kids are watching trailers for movies that come out next year. It's like, right, right. And so <laughs> there was a point to where I was, I kept asking, it's like, are they going to, I mean, it's been a year since they made any announcement and we're almost done with the movie, they should start talking about it. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the way they wanted to do it. Um, But I will give them props for, uh, they advertised it on the uh, adult. Well, I mean, on the animation block on Sunday night, it was, Oh really? It was within those shows. Oh, on on Fox, on Fox. So that was pretty big. But the thing is even yesterday. So Mary Spender, who plays Mary in the movie, if you, youtube her there she did a video with me about the movie and um it's actually a really good piece oh okay so her thing went up it's been like three days and i actually took screenshots of this and sent it to to fox i said guys you know i mean i thought adult swims advertising was bad but this is like non-existent <laughs> yeah it really was it was nothing and so yeah. uh, tubi had their they put a trailer up and it had been up there 10 days and it had 1700 views and then mary's piece went up It'd been up three to two days. It had 19,000 views. I was like, something's wrong with this picture. That what they should have done was, and I had a meeting with them on Zoom. We talked about the promotional stuff. And I said, we really got to tap into our, our audience. You need to get with Dan Snyder. Let him start talking about it. Mm-hmm. Let, let these people start talking about it. They all have a presence in that social media world. And that's where everything is right now. And yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And then <laughs> nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> It, it felt like I was just kind of screaming into the void when I was talking about the film before it came out. And like the only yeah. reason I was assured it was coming out was because of you telling me it was. So that's why I was like, yeah, like even when I was talking with Craig, I'm like, from what I understand, it's still like it's coming out. Like, I don't I've not, I haven't seen any published pieces about it, but it comes out in three days or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, it was like I, and I don't want to just sit here and badmouth Tubi because, you know, they let you make this film. I do. I I want to badmouth them because I've written them and said, you guys, I I love that you love this thing and we got to make it, um, whoever you are, but (laughs) Mr. Tubi, but there's got to be a way to like get the word out more than, than what you did. So, but it's out there and I'm looking at it right now. We still have a 7.6 on IMDb. (laughs) It's not bad. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's not bad. Yeah. Especially for that kind of a movie, that kind of a monster ish kind of film, I think is pretty good. I can't help but notice that there were there were uh, there was like a parallel between Plantasm and that is the main character undergoes a visual change. You have Frylock, you know, with his new box design, and then mm-hmm. you have Emma in Postocalypse undergoing a a change during the film. How did that come about? Did you like when did you decide that you wanted her to undergo such like a a, a stark visual change? Um, because I thought it would be cool, you know. And I think the visuals even help with her like journey. You know, she's she's changed in a lot of ways, a total 180, basically. Mm-hmm. And that was a lot of fun to do. I, you know, and then with Manicotti, you know, I really drew from, you know, having worked on Darkman and, and that sort of those like uh, films where where the, the person like the fly, like they just get so insane and immersed in their work or something tragic happens and they're still there. But there's something else mm-hmm. like when he turns into Manicotti, you know, the mm-hmm. monster. Um so that's what I was kind of drawing from, you know, I had a lot of, you know, you know, my background with, with films that I like, and uh, right, right. I tried to put a lot of that in here and even pulled from like, I made a lot, I made, I made a adult swims first live action sort of horror comedy called stiff. And, um, 
at the end of that show, the, the monster pulls his face off and throws it against the wall. And then we see it. And I did that in pasta, you know, <laughs> this is cool. So yeah, doing that stuff was just a blast. Right, right. Well, I, I also saw like a uh, similarity to colon movie film in the beginning of Postocalypse when it pops up like the time and then it's like Eastern time after that, like just that silly kind of a uh, title card sequence there. Yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See Fox had Fox and Tubi had, had issues with the time jumps because there's a lot of time jumps in the beginning. And so they had some specific thoughts. And so we worked through them and uh, then we just started adding extra things. <laughs> it's like, okay, so we fixed your time jump thoughts. Now we're just going to add all this other stuff mm-hmm. to put back the crazy. Mm-hmm. Right, right, exactly. With those time cuts, did you go into writing the script kind of wanting to do time cuts or did they just kind of happen naturally? No, I wanted to do it that way. Um, another movie that I love is Domino and it kind of works that way. It starts out at the end and then we go back and we see what happens. Um, and then eventually that kind of fades away. And that's what that's what pasta does. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel I feel like it works. It might be a little confusing to some sort of mainstreamy people mm-hmm. who are just more vanilla in what they watch. But I think it's I, I like it. I, th- I think it just adds more dynamics to to the, to a way of opening the movie. There are there probably are a few too many, but I'm, I'm still thinking it's working. I mean, I, I thought it was just interesting. Like, I feel like I don't you don't see films like that a lot anymore where there's like that many time cuts. Mm-hmm. But there I, f- I found there was an anchor to the film, which was the the in-universe film Windbreakers, because even though you're jumping through times and you're seeing like different groups of characters, I feel like at some point all the different groups of characters mention this film, which is interesting because. I mean, you don't really see this kind of monoculture anymore in today's day and age where mm. everyone has seen like the same film. But uh, how did the idea for Windbreakers come about? It came about because initially those newscaster segments were were more uh, ha- uh, hammy. And there were there was a lot of puns in them with pasta and talking about what was going on. And after we put them all together, I was like, this this is like the worst part of this thing every time i go to a news it just wasn't working it just was it just felt cheap and then i said what if they just start talking what if they sort of bring up what's happening in the world but then they're immediately interested in this other movie that's coming out (laughs) and so (laughs) and so i just kind of and i had to do some rereads for it because i like that mary has seen it and wanted to show it to emma and that the newscasters are just like way into it and then mm-hmm. so much so that at the very end we actually show a scene from it right, um, right. i just thought it it kind of broke the fourth wall um in a unique way so it's like we're we're, we're already breaking the wall by talking about what's going on in the movie but mm-hmm. then i love that we transitioned to we're more interested in this other movie Right. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. Right, right. And just like the announcer, you know, after he goes home, he's in his apartment. He turns that that movie on, you know, <laughs> and then turns it off. <laughs> and so for the sequel, I pitched Windbreakers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was going to merge the pasta world with Windbreakers. And they said, no, hold on. We want to do something else with that. So, so that's where that sits. Well, I guess now that we're talking about it, I am also noticing the parallel between Plantasm with the Moon and Knights cutting in. You kind of had that mm-hmm. as well with the newscasters cutting in every once did, in a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To back up to the first scene of the film, because we have this like nice forest scene and, and you know, jumping into the film, when I watched it, there wasn't even a trailer out, so I had no idea what to expect. So I'm like, oh, this, this is nice. You know, you got some, some, some deer in the forest. And then like the, the, the pasta creatures come out and there's just like this gore and violence and I think really sets the tone of the film did you come up with that right away or did that scene come later? No, we added that way later. Um, we did. And because it, it originally, it opened up with just Emma's birthday party, just her voice. It was voiceover. It was her nice mansion talking about how rich she is and famous. And then she says, I had this killer birthday party. And then we go to the carnage mm-hmm. <laughs> that worked as well. But, but then we decided that there was some language in it that wasn't, I couldn't get Lauren back to reread and so there she was saying some stuff in tenses that wasn't working so i thought let's just go total disney let's disney this up (laughs) and let's start you know because because the beginning of the movie happens even before you know happens way after Mm possible so we we jump so we're in the future (laughs) right 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 (laughs) and then we back all the way up yeah so it just kind of says in the beginning that this is not for kids (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, 
it says that after making you think it might be for kids in the first <laughs> five seconds, but then uh, 10 seconds in, you've got yeah. your answer. I was thinking, you know, I think the first thing that came up with is it's it's like a starry night, Bambi comes out, and then pasta gets her. <laughs> and then we just went nuts with it. And right. Bento was so, I mean, it has a whole different look from the movie, too. It's like, mm-hmm. It's actually like fully animated and it's not as right as glitchy it's glossy you know so speaking of the pasta themed deaths which there are many and they're all like really, really unique you don't really see the same one twice did mm-hmm. you have any input on those deaths like did you come in with ideas oh yeah i came in with ideas and then they had ideas that they would show me mm-hmm. and i was like yes this is all working and clearly there's the uh sphere of death pastas from Phantasm mm-hmm, in this mm-hmm. movie. Yes. And yeah. So we show that, that a yeah. couple times. <laughs> yes. But yeah, you're right. I think all the deaths are are unique. Um, they're really not the same. Mm-hmm. And it's just it, to me, I wanted to go so I wanted to go brain dead, evil dead too with this thing. It's like just gored up so much that it's very gory, but it's also ridiculous in a way right. that yeah, it's not hurtful. So you don't really feel feel bad for the people getting killed because it's so silly. <laughs> it's so yeah, it's so extreme and silly that it's not relatable at all. Plus, you know, it's I guess it's pasta doing it. It's like you're you're not actually afraid of that happening to you. Yeah, and as you probably noticed too, there's some inconsistencies. Like people just turn into pasta, <laughs> or like those. <laughs> and, uh, what are those uh, things at the San Francisco Wharf? Those those sea creatures. I mean, they get they get a wave of marinara, and then they're suddenly. <laughs> you know, pasta. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> it was just fun yeah yeah that, that yeah that's the vibe i got it, it was just fun and like for for some reason i didn't find myself caring about those kinds of inconsistencies i think just because the premise of the movie was so silly that it's like i'm not gonna yeah. sit here and like get into pasta things you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah well we talked about the voice actors a little bit is was there anybody that you wanted to get for the film that you were unable to uh no actually i was very lucky Mm -hmm. The people that I wanted, I brought the whole cast to the table at Fox because we had a meeting with casting. And, uh, you know, it's very different than working with Adult Swim. Adult Swim, you just get people and if they work, you know, nobody has input. But with Fox, they were like, we're Fox. We're big time. You're not. And we're going to tell you (laughs) if we approve of these people. (laughs) And so so we had the meeting. I'm like, okay, I really want Dana Snyder to play Manicotti because I know Working with him, he can pull this character off because his character's insane and Dana can go there. And they were into that. And I think they knew that was coming because I think I talked about it and the rumor hit Fox. And then and then the, everybody else just kind of naturally, they were just, okay, okay. The only person I had to audition was Mary Spender. Oh, okay. Uh, and I just worked with Lauren Holt on Plantasm. She had a bit part, but I, I kept hearing her voice in my head when I was writing the script. I'm like, this has got to be Lauren. Mm-hmm. I just heard she's going to work for this, the way she talks and, and her, her the sound of her voice. Yeah, she killed it. She killed it. And, yeah, and, and so did Lavelle Crawford. You know, it's oh, yeah. like, <laughs> God dang, you know, it's like... <laughs> He, the, the records went on and on and on with him because he just kept going and going. And that's what this needed. You know, we needed yeah. that, bring it to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, then I mentioned Jess Harnell. I've, I've worked with him. I, I did a Disney. He was on my first uh, Disney XD pilot. He came in and did a bunch of voices. That guy is amazing. He, he, he plays halfway and the lawyer and the, and the newscaster. That guy is so amazing. It's like, and he's the nicest person he looks like he just walked out of the band White Snake. <laughs> you know, he does. I, I saw a picture of him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if you saw him from a distance, you'd be like, "I'm, you know, I'm kind of afraid to talk to that guy." But if you went up and and introduced yourself, you'd just be a big old hug. And mm-hmm. how are you? It's like the guy is so, and he's so fun to work with. Just brought it to the table. Um, but yeah, and it, but the one person I was unsure of was I really wanted to get Bill Sanderson for Al Dente Bob. And I kept hearing his voice in my head when I was writing the first draft, you know, so I had all these people in my head from the beginning of the first script because Bill has that just sort of like vulnerable Southern, you know, really friendly voice. And and I only really know him from when he played the toy maker in Blade Runner. I just, I can hear him talking all the time. I'm like, God, it'd be so great to work with him. I wonder if he'll do it. And uh, they, they reached out and he was like, yeah, I'll do this. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> so he was the one like unknown mm-hmm. that I was hoping to get that I was able to get. And then conversations with him before, you know, before we recorded were fantastic. I was actually nervous talking to him. So I'm like, God, I'm talking to the guy from Blade Runner. And uh, 
of course, he did all these other things. He was on that New Heart show. He did way bigger things, but I knew him from there. So Mary Spender, I had to get them audition. I had to basically not fight for her, but I had to convince them. It's like, I know she's going to work. She's not a voiceover talent at all. She does music and that's her thing. But she does so many things so well. And they were they just like trusted me on getting her. And mm -hmm. so we got her. And I will say that my first take on her, because um, I wanted her to be the Ripley of the team, you know, the badass. And so, so the first round with her, we plugged in some scenes and sent them to Fox. And they were like, you know, we really need to lighten her up. And so when I was listening to what they were saying and listening to the show, I'm like, because she was too badass. You know what I'm saying? Mm, sure. Everybody yeah. else is kind of goofy. And so she kind of stood out. So I had to go back and re-record her. And I told her, it's like, this is not your fault. This is me because I directed you this way on purpose. So let's lighten it up. So let's open that bottle of wine and start start over and I'll rewrite <laughs> some stuff. And Right. Yeah. And so it, and then they then they loved it. Um, I think she does a great job. Yeah, yeah. It was it was nice. I, I know there were people who were excited to hear her, you know, twelve ounce mouse fans were excited yeah. to see her there. That's the only other thing that she's really done, right? Was twelve ounce mouse besides her music career. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, she has a big YouTube channel, a mm -hmm. lot of followers, and she does silly she's getting sillier with her material, but she's also serious about her stuff and Oh my God, she put out a video yesterday and you know, you see the screenshot and I'm looking at her with a guitar and some other older guy with a guitar. And I'm like, that guy looks like Jigsaw from the Saw movies. And she was just in LA. And so I, I, I turned on the video and they're, and they're doing a cover and it's fucking Jigsaw. <laughs> oh, really? With Barry Spender. <laughs> looks like Jigsaw because it is Jigsaw. Holy cow. <laughs> That's Tobin great. Bell. How did you ever find that guy, Mary? <laughs> and he sings, and he's awesome. Wow, he's such okay. a contrast, right? From his from his killer mode in Saw mm. movies to <laughs> singing "Knocking on Heaven's Door." It's like you don't want to see that. It's like, I don't want to see that because mm. I know him as this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I, I can't have this influence my uh, yeah love of his uh, work on Saw. Yeah, but anyway, for Mary, it's like you know, I told her in the beginning, it's like I, I'm going to have to talk Fox in to using you because and she was cool with that and we auditioned and um yeah so it worked out great and they they love her mm -hmm. hopefully she'll be in the sequel well she is in the sequel if it gets if it gets greenlit so the script is done I, I saw at the end there was a bunch of studios listed so like you guys just had people go to studios and then you would like call in with them right that's how you did it you were you ever in person with any of the voice actors no i wanted to be i wanted to be because i feel like it's better but um with the budgetary constraints i couldn't get out to la because most of them were in la and i was trying to back to back them so i could be out there in person but no it worked it worked pretty good over zoom so there was all zoom and and the girl who mixed plantasm at skywalker she plays the disembodied voice you hear where she's a burrito complete that kind of stuff yeah so her name is bonnie wild and uh and I, I worked with her for like three months or two months on aqua teen out at, at uh skywalker and she was so much fun and so good and, and she had just come off doing like she does mandalorian boba fett she does all these big things <laughs> and i was like right, how does it right, feel to right. be on our movie if you do he's like it's amazing <laughs> it's like it's just fun i'm sure it's it is, liberating yeah. there's not yeah. 25 executives standing behind me trying to justify mm. their jobs <laughs> so but she mm. had a bit part in one of the jurassic uh park movies where she is over the loudspeaker saying there's been an anomaly so I'm like, you're going to do that for pasta. Will you do that for pasta? She's like, of course. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. great. I have to wonder, did she intend to be a voice actor when getting that job? Like, it seems like she just kind of happened into it, which is really cool. No, you know, she got the Jurassic Park gig because she was there at Skywalker and they were looking for that voice. And somebody told her that I think the director said, just go do it and just let me know. And let me because they couldn't find something. And then they picked her. So I think, no, I don't think she's a voiceover, you know, she's not looking to do that, but, uh, but she did it for that movie and then she did it for mine. It's like such a thrill. And she actually says a line right out of Star Wars, which is, I can't remember, what is it? You know, when they're, it's after the San Francisco bit and he's like, launch the bow ties. And, and uh, I totally ripped a line out of there where the guy's like charging up the Death Star Ray <laughs> with that weird black helmet. Right, right. And that's her saying it. <laughs> There are some, uh, you know, some of my influences in movies are in Postocalypse. And sometimes I completely just rip the line from the movie that I liked. Like on the boat, 
when Mary says, can you fly Emma? And just throws her off the mm-hmm. boat. And that's from Robocop. Oh, right? is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> can, you, can you fly body? And <laughs> yes, he throws yeah, him yeah. out the back of the... Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that too uh, while covering Aqua Teen, like uh, that you guys will do that from time to time. It's like an exact line from some other film, which is so great. <laughs> oh, yeah. You wrote Postocalypse, but you didn't direct it. Jason Schwartz did. did yeah, did I found you... that out a week before they delivered it. Oh, that he directed it? Specifically? And I called him and I said, I directed... You know what? I think there's a there's a line between you're the director of something, whatever animation at the studio level, but mm-hmm. then there's a director that oversees the whole project, and that's what I thought I did for nine months until Fox oh. told me that they had hired a director, and I was like, "Well, nobody told me that." It's like, who is it? And they said, "Oh, it's Jason Schwartz." I'm like, "God, I love Jason Schwartz," but I just don't see where he is gets that that you know so. I mean, he definitely worked on the thing a lot and put together storyboards and we were, he was in the edits and, you know, he picked a lot of the shots and we'd talk about shots, but that was kind of a weird situation for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm like, what do I tell the director's guild that I didn't, that I directed it, but my name's not on it. <laughs> and they're like, we don't know. And then, you know, so it's what it is. So oh, yeah. I, Cause I was surprised by that. Cause I was under the impression that you were yeah. directing it like all of your other stuff. Really? I was totally surprised too. Cause I got a cut before the final and it's the, the first title card is written and directed by Matt Malero. And then they wanted right. to put EP right after. And I was like, I don't need 40 credits right at the top, just written and directed <laughs> by put EP way at the end, uh-huh. like in the scroll. So I got that. Yeah. And then, and then I got sent another copy. Like here's the one we gave to Fox. And I was looking at it, and and that was the first time. It was like a week before it aired. Um, so I was like, how come my director credit got dropped? And like, nobody responded. So I had to call <laughs> I had to call Fox and say, what happened? And they looked into it, and they told me that they had hired a director. So I was like, okay. So we'll see. I'm, You know, it's like that was a real disappointment for me. That's probably the biggest disappointment. The only disappointment of the whole movie was that that happened. Right, because right. Making the whole film was a blast, and working mm-hmm. with Bento was a blast. So we'll see on the second one. I asked for it for the second one. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Jason Schwartz, at least, you know, somebody that you know, and he's worked on Aqua Teen, Squid Billies, 12 Ounce Miles. So it's Jason's so good. He's so funny and dry. And I mean, we really hit it off. Um, It just, I had no idea that that was sort of the hierarchy out there. Fox is like, well, we hired directors for this and that. I'm like, yeah, but so what am I supposed to do? Like, not direct the movie? right yeah it's that's, really weird i'm I, yeah I, i'm uh I'm, I'm like kind of speechless to find out that like that's how you discovered it was it was just like the title card was changed that's i know it's all paperwork and legal and it, it's it's just a bunch of bullshit honestly <laughs> well we know in our hearts who the who the real director is on uh yeah. on post Oculus. of course not to discredit you know what jason did but yeah it's just like like you said like he wasn't directing the vo- voice. He wasn't putting the voice cast. Like, no, it's you know what? Strange. No, it's like, that's where the movie comes from. First of all, you know, it's the idea. Then it becomes a script that works with characters. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it, the movie is given life when you record it. Mm-hmm. That's where you get the movie. Mm-hmm. And then you put it together. There it is. It's been directed. It's the movie. So there's just a, there's just like, you know how they have like, like uh, above the line, below the line and on movies. It's like, yeah, there's just a line to where there's a studio director and then there's the guy who directed the movie. So, so it just got lost in translation as far as I know. To jump to one of the characters in the film, there's a snowman character. And my understanding from what Craig Harton told me was like, that wasn't in the script. It just kind of like came about. Can you talk a little bit about that character getting introduced? Yeah. Yeah. Because it was like at first, he was competing against like some um, uh, Arctic dude who lived in the North pole. And so there was always that sort of snow aspect to it. Um, (laughs) And then, and I I named him something really weird and Fox just wasn't going for it. They're like, we can't, we can't mess with those, with that, with that. And so then, you know, it was in the edit room. It's like, what if it's just a fucking snowman, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, how adult swim is that? Right, and he uses right. his own limbs to make the stuff, and everything he makes is frozen, and there's snow, mm-hmm. and so yeah, so that came up in the room, and so we changed it. Um, Fox did kind of balk at it, 
but I think that was one of the wins that we got when we debated very courteously <laughs> that we would really like to keep the snowman. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it just comes like so out of left field and it reminds you of like who's making the movie that Yeah. Yeah, it's like wait, there's a snowman cooking in this and there's like no discussion of it. Nobody's like Oh, he's a snowman. It's just like, yep, there he is. He's cooking. I know. Nobody, nobody's freaked out by it or anything. And then, he, you know, he wins and he has his own line of cookware and standees. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> and it, another thing that changed too was um, originally I wanted the newscasters to be Muppets and we were oh, going to shoot okay. them live action and just have them be oh, Muppety sure. and talking. Yeah. And then um, that wasn't going to quite work. So then Bento designed <clears throat> Mupp- animated Muppet looking characters. I was like, that is so funny. Just like, you know, the lip flap is just open, close, open, close. But but Fox was, they pushed it back against that. So we went back with like the humans that we have. And it still works great. But yeah, the Muppets yeah. may have been, it may have been overkill after the snowman. So. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I, and, you know, like, I think the like without the Muppets, it makes the snowman a little bit more impactful. That like yeah. it's just this crazy because if there were a bunch of crazy characters outside of the pasta creatures, yeah, then it would maybe be a little too much possibly. But yeah, it's nice that that snowman possibly. Just gets, yeah, you're right. Possibly, you're yeah. right. I've noticed that there were like some vague political overtones to the film, and that's not really something that you get into in Aquatine a whole lot. So was it fun for you mm-hmm. to you know have this character ranting politically, but about like gluten about something that really isn't that political but like you got to go on these kind of rants that you don't normally get to do is is that something that you wish you could do more of like an aqua teen no not really um i, I think aqua teen works without it mm-hmm. i think it'd be a different vibe if we put that kind of stuff in there um i only do it a couple times in pasta mm-hmm. and i'm actually surprised that one of them got through the fox filter but it did and it's silly um, Which one is it? Because I feel like I might know. It's when Al Dente is talking about all the they found the rogue group in San Francisco. Yeah, the keep, list kids of, in Ma- yeah that whole yeah, list of things. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's I thought it was funny just to go there with that. It, plus, it's coming out of the the mouth of a pasta creature. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so it's not like we're we're hammering it into your face. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and and the reaction is just ridiculous to it. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it was fun to go there a couple times with that and it might have even been a test to see if they would shut it down like sometimes you put stuff in scripts <laughs> knowing it's going to get killed <laughs> but nobody said anything <laughs> so it doesn't really come off as like politically charged as it just comes out as silly because of the way it's worded then he runs out of breath and then the yeah. guy reacts yeah yeah <laughs> like like i said it's like a like a vague political overtone but it's nothing it's nothing like specifics but like i i yeah. I, I wasn't sure if like the character of emma if that was supposed to be political too, because she gets like the colored hair and stuff like that. Or was it just completely? No, I mean, no, I don't, I, that wasn't motivated by that at all. Honestly, that was motivated by a girl who sings for arch enemy. She, oh, she, okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, that is a great image. There's a still of her somewhere where it's, she's like got this huge long green hair and she's wearing this ripped up leather, or whatever. Uh-huh. And I'm like, that looks badass. And so I want to give Emma green hair, you know, it was actually, I mean, it's, my reference, my influence for that was when Ash builds the chainsaw for his arm <laughs> yeah, and becomes yeah. that thing. So that's what I was going for. Yeah, it had nothing to do with, with that. So You brought up Arch Enemy. So in the vein of that, at the end of the film, we have an amazing song. I don't know if the band's name is Anchor or Ancor, but uh, they do a song called Bite Me at the end, which was great. How did you get hooked up with them? Because I'd never heard of them, but that song oh was my God. insane. That is, they're the most unique band out there right now. I think they're amazing. So um, the singer, her name is Jessie. Um, I had reached out to her with Jim Fortier on a project we had called Yinor. So we, uh, we, we were auditioning people and she auditioned for Bingo. And I just got on their website and hit contact webmaster, which I knew was going to be them. And I just sent him an email and then she wrote back. And so she did the audition. So I got to kind of like have a connection um, and super nice. And then when it, when it came time to do something for pasta at the end, cause I really wanted to, we could, we could have a whole conversation on music. I really wanted to have its own theme song because it's like, this is such a ridiculous movie. It needs its own theme song. It doesn't need something canned from the library. And, and whatever is going on in the song needs to be talking about pasta, you know? And so I reached out to Anchor um, and said, 
would you guys, I know this is really silly and you guys aren't, but I would love for you <laughs> to blast out something for my end credits on this movie. And I told them what the movie was and they were digging it. And I knew they would dig it because there's a lot of uh, YouTube videos where they're in there. They have a room that's just filled with bobbleheads. They love animation. They love Marvel. They love all this stuff. So I'm like, okay, this, I don't know. And they were like, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> <I'm> like, yes. <laughs> And it was so, it just, when they first, when they sent the first demo, I was just blown away. I don't think I stopped playing it for like an hour. I was just sitting in my office with my speakers over and over and over. So that came out because I did half of the music in the movie mm -hmm. and then I was going to do my own end credit song. And I was like, no, I really need to get, so, you know, anchor came up and I was like, nobody had ever heard of them. I'm like, they're going to rip this thing. They did an amazing job. Yeah. They, they did. They're so great. Mm -hmm. I love that song and, and it, it's original to this thing. So I saw they're from Spain or something. Is that? Yeah. They're, they're in Spain. Yeah. They just put out this huge thing. It's, they just put out some new material recently and um, you should, you should look at them. What I like about them is that they're just unique. They're like metal, mm -hmm. and then they can slow down. Yeah, and that girl yeah. screams her head off, but then she has the most beautiful voice to sing with. It's just they're really fun. Yeah, I, I love that when like the the female vocalist does the cleans, but also the, the the dirty vocals as well. Because a lot of times you'll see it's just like, and nothing against them, but like the girl does just the clean, and then somebody else does yeah the screaming. But it's like it's so cool when it's just one one woman just going fucking nuts one i know just doing it all i mean she's a powerhouse right well i guess that leads into i, I have a fan question here for you from listener cup on drugs and they want to know if there will be a soundtrack uh, especially because of that song at the end of the movie like i guess people want the song and people want uh your work on the film as well your uh soundtrack work you know i i don't know that's the question i should ask fox and tubi if that's ever going to happen so that's never been brought up but um Anchor right now wants to try to do something with their song and promote themselves and that they worked on this movie. Mm -hmm. That's another little thing I'm having with Fox right now. Can they do that? Because okay. you guys aren't doing anything. And, <laughs> like, and they said, no, we don't really usually let people do that. I'm like, they're not making money on it. They're just promoting it. <laughs> so I'm going through that right now. And I'm tempted just to, because I have the full song. So what you hear is almost the full song. You're missing the intro that builds mm -hmm. into it. So it needs to get out there because it just it kicks ass. Oh, yeah, I was blown away. And like, I'm kind of picky about the metal that I hear. Mm -hmm. And like, that was legit. That was like so good. So it's a, a little sad that it's not out yet. And hopefully it does get to come out. I know. I hope so. We're still working our way through that. I'll let you know if something pops up and send you links. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess to move on to a couple fan questions here about the film. Yeah. And I have a question from Ian over at corndogcentral.com. And he points out how in season three of 12 Ounce Mouse, we see uh, mm -hmm. this this uh, pasta character in the back flanked by bow tie noodles. Is that like yep. like the embryo of your idea for Postocalypse? <laughs> because this came out in 2020 and you said you had the idea for Postocalypse in 2016. So I did. So let me explain what that is. That um, I had gotten with my buddy, Corey Sherman. I got with him on the Postocalypse idea and we kind of worked through some ideas and he he actually did this art and i pitched it as a show to adult swim and they were not interested so we still had the art laying around and that was always manicotti right there yeah so we just decided to throw it into the screens i think there are in the in that season there's other screens with like my cat and mary's cat and then i thought pasta would work perfectly right here so my idea was always that there was this crazy manicotti dude and that bow ties would run around and you know, do bad things to people and all kinds of noodles. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely a, like an early version of what, what we have now. 
Wow, I wasn't expecting that. I figured it was like, no, I had nothing to do with that. No, no, I had everything to do with it with Corey. And then and then when I went to um when I told Corey later that I had sold pasta to I mean, I had completely changed it. Like it, the idea we came up with it was like night and day from what I have now. So yeah. Next question is from listener Chris. And Chris first of all said, Loved this movie so much. My question for Matt, as someone who's been making weird shows and films for decades. Do you see the current media landscape as less or more hostile to outsider storytelling? And then also, what advice would you have for a newcomer who wants to make their own postocalypse? Well, I mean, as far as I honestly don't watch anything. I don't watch any Netflix or I, I, I go to movies occasionally. I go see the stuff that I like that I know I'm going to like or ho- hopefully like. I think that um, there's definitely a place for this kind of storytelling because I think we need a little bit of everything. So this is what I do. And then other people write dramas that have meaningful messages. But I always feel like movies and TV, I feel like they their first thing should be entertainment. You know, that's how I see it. And that's how I see this movie. It's just fun and entertaining. And there's there's no like, it's not going to change your life, <laughs> you know, and I'm not trying to drive some point home. I'm just trying to have fun. And as far as making your own, like just do it. Go find some people that can help you who can draw, you know, maybe make an animatic. I mean, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to. So you might as well start trying. You know, it took me a long time to get into this this field. And and I just happened to land in it. I wasn't even an animation freak. I never read comic books. You know, I always wanted to make horror movies and action things and and I tried to do that. And and, a, and then this just the Space Coast started and I just jumped on because they knew I was a funny writer and and um, that's how it, it landed for me. So it was like it wasn't really planned, but I'm really happy as as to the track that, I, that I've been on for a long time. But it's like you just have to go out and do it. You know, nobody's going to nobody's going to do it for you. If you have the talent, you can do one thing, do it and get some buddies and put it together. And, you know, the other hard part is trying to show people, but with like YouTube and social media, you can do that thing all day long and then maybe it'll get noticed. So it's a lot easier now. It's easier and harder. It's easier because you can get your material out there and seen by a lot of people. Um, But it's also harder because there's so much material out there. So it really has to stand out and shine, you know? And if you're not like, if you don't have like an agent or a manager it's almost impossible to show them, but you can show them through social media. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can't deliver it to them without that sort of guidance. So go for it is what I say, but just don't do postocalypse because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think Chris here, he specifically wanted to make postocalypse. So he wants to rip you off. Well, if he wants to make one and put it on, yeah, that's fine. You know, that'll help. <laughs> that'll help my movie. I'd love to see what somebody else would do with this. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're like Stephen King, who sells the rights to his uh, short stories for a dollar. You're uh, giving away <laughs> Postocalypse idea for free. I tell you, there's a food theme happening too between Aqua Teen and Postocalypse. Yeah. I'm not sure where that's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, we should dive into your dietary habits here, Matt, because I'm sensing a real uh, theme. I didn't want to bring it up, but you mentioned it. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't eat any of that stuff. But you don't eat pasta. <laughs> I do eat pasta. I do eat pasta. But when it comes to fast food, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what about like back when you guys made Aqua Teen? Were you more into fast food then? You know, twenty three years no, ago? No, not at all. I mean, we just you know, it, you know, Aqua Teen stemmed from a Space Ghost episode where he was at a fast food place. He couldn't afford to pay for it, so in lieu of money, they put the characters <laughs> on the show to advertise. Yeah, and that's where that came from. So yeah. Uh-huh. Um, do you guys remember filming that part with Space Ghost when you went back and made the Baffler Meal episode? You have Space Ghost at a restaurant. Do you remember doing that? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember who shot it. I remember, yeah, when Guy from Turner came and yeah, we went in there and, and shot. And that, that was so long ago because I remember the digital camera I had to take stills was like this massive two megapixel <laughs> Olympus thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally remember. Oh, I remember. I remember almost all of those shoots. Mm-hmm. Um, and I recently dug up some stuff that we had put on DVDs like uh, future wolf and yes. Yeah. And radon. Yep. I mean, yep. uh, and there's, there's one that Dave and I made that I can't find anywhere. It was, uh, it was called day off. It was, I had a Michael Myers puppet. Oh yeah. I've seen that somewhere. And Dave had just got this video camera that took cassettes, but it shot HD. 
Oh. And we're like, we're going to make a movie, you know? <laughs> mm. And we, yeah, we shot that. I just happened to get this Michael Myers doll and we had this idea. <laughs> you know, since then, though, if you look it up, I mean, there's like, I don't know if we were one of the first ones, but there's a lot of videos on what Michael does on his day off. Yeah. But I think we were the first one. Because, I mean, this was back in like 2001 or mm. two. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about that. It's so much more common for people to do stuff like that with Michael Myers. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even think about that. You guys were uh, yeah. heading the charge on that one, but then you lost it. We were ahead of our time. You can't find it now. So <laughs> I don't know where it is. I think Dave says he has a copy, but I, I haven't seen him. He hasn't delivered it to me yet. <laughs> I'll see if I can, because I feel like I've seen it at some point. I'll see if I could find it like online or something. Cool. I have another question here for you from uh, SwimWiki2001 on Twitter. SwimWiki wants to know, what was one part of the film that Matt thought came out the best? Um, man, that's that's hard to. I mean, I'm happy with the whole film. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really point to one. I mean, I think that San Francisco montage scene is really fun. That came out really good. It's just a bunch of action and gore and kills, and um, that was cool. Uh, I liked when uh, Emma gets eaten by the octopus, and then and then she saws her way out of it that was good and that actually that, that came from bento bento because i i didn't know what to do with the octopus and bento said what if this happened i'm like yes that's what should happen <laughs> so i think that stood, stands out to me too because because i didn't i wasn't expecting that mm -hmm. you know and it was like wow that's fun that's like sharknado that's uh, that's yeah. like in a way it's like it's really good mm -hmm. um so yeah i can't really I, I mean the end theme song to me is great i mean i, I like the credit I like what's behind the opening credits. I mean, um, I like it when the when the title comes up, and that's me whispering "postocalypse." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's I was about to ask that. I was going to say who whispers that. I, I assumed it was you, yeah. but I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, I'm not supposed to say that because I'm not SAG. But oh yeah, because I was going to say you're not credited. But I'm like, who else would that be? It had to have been Matt. Yeah. Should I cut that from the episode? <laughs> no, leave it in. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's already out there. Maybe they'll tap Hartley me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, do you have a favorite pasta noodle? Uh, if yeah, I, uh, if I had to pick one, it'd be angel hair. I just like it better than all the other ones. I do make a lot of lasagnas. Oh, that's good. So I'm way into cooking stuff like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, some of the original designs when when Bento was thinking about how these things should look and move, and I think one of the one of the animators or artists actually filmed a piece of noodle with a screw turning like it was live action you know and i was like wow this is cool this is how this is coming together so mm -hmm. yeah that's a little tidbit on it i tell you the sequel is really good too um it hasn't been greenlit for production yet i'm not sure if they're waiting on the other two movies they tend to like, do three at a time so they can get the tax break down here which which makes sense and then everything kind of overlaps but it um it's going to be really it's going to be really kick-ass and I'm trying to get Danny Trejo in it. Oh. I just recorded Danny yesterday for Aqua Team. Oh, really? Yeah. He has uh he only has two lines, but it was it was so much fun. I was like, <laughs> God, I'm interviewing Machete. <laughs> yeah, that's so sick. Oh my gosh. I'm excited for that, man. Yeah. I feel like with, with Danny Trejo, like two lines is still that's still good, man. Because people will know it's him as soon as they hear that voice. Totally. The second you hear the first word, you know it's him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was so nice and so into it you, because, you know, you see what characters he plays and mm -hmm. he just looks like he just wants to kill you. But he came in just like hopping around and he's like, I need more lines. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I want to ask about and you kind of brought it up. Uh, Yinor, the uh, pilot that you and Jim Fortier yeah. did that premiered a month or two ago, a little while ago. Mm -hmm. How did that come together? Well, Jim and I were just kicking around ideas to do one, what they call the 4 a.m.ers when they, they have a little bit of money to make something silly, then they put it on at four. We had a bunch of ideas that we're, we're trying to form. We had this clown versus pirates thing, and we had uh, Yinor. And so what, what we were trying to do originally was do one of those clip shows. When I was a kid, you would watch, before the new cartoons came out during the summer, they'd have like a half hour show of, of, of celebrities talking about the new cartoons that were coming out and they'd show clips of them. And so that's what this was. And then we had just been purchased by AT&T. So we had, the whole theme was that 
AT&T corporate had created these shows and this was their idea of entertainment. And so the shows were ridiculous because it's like a phone company comes in and makes a cartoon, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so that was the whole thing. So it was live action mixed with clips. We really loved the Yenor character a lot. Um, Yenor and Bingo would that really, we liked all the shows, but we liked that one. And then what happened was there was the pandemic and then nobody could get together to shoot live action. And this, you know, it took like almost three, seems like three years to get done. Oh, wow. So, so because of the pandemic, we weren't, we were just like on hold because we can't do live action. We, there's no way to do it, but we're all going to get killed and by this virus. And so we, Jim and I said, well, let's, why don't we just make one and just make it animated because you can do animation. So we pitched the idea of just doing Yenor and we pitched it to Walt Newman. He was in charge of the, these four amers and he, he liked it. So we, uh, so we just started writing Yenor and making that its own show. And just so you know, Yenor is a uh, Roni spelled backwards. Oh. And our old production manager was yeah, Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I really like penguins cause I had done Penguino, which was a rock opera. Did you ever see that? No, I'm not even, I've never even heard of that before. You know, it never even got really put together. I did it for digital. I had variations of it. I'll send it to you. Yeah, please do. And uh, and you can do whatever you want with it. But I, it's like some of it's storyboards. But it's so so we so we did. You know, we worked really hard on it, and then we cast it with some really great people. Um, Mark Prox, mm -hmm. which I really love, and and Jim was like the one who brought him to the table because he was a major fan, and I liked him a lot too. And then I got um, <clears throat> for Bingo. I I got. The, the guy who played, uh, he was in the live action Dirk Gently. He played Dirk Gently. Oh, and he was okay. just like a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And it, it, yeah, so we made it. We made it. And then they said, well, <clears throat> the network said, well, you know, we focus test everything now. So we can't tell you. We can't even tell you if we like it because it won't matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jim and I were like, God, you know, the, the company's changed so much. Now right. they focus test stuff because back in the day, you just made it and then it, they put it on the air. But um, they either got bigger, it got more corporate. So we're waiting. The focus test finally started happening. And I think Jim tuned into one of them. He said it was all glitchy. And the lady was talking about calling it Yanor. And it was just oh, like, it, it just no. couldn't go more wrong. Right. So you're just kind of hoping like, do, are soccer moms going to love this? Because that's who they're talking to. Yeah, yeah. So it came back and it tested. They were like, well, it didn't test through the roof, but it tested good. But we're not going to make it. So I'm like, well, then I guess you had to say the whole time and not the focus test. So right. it's too bad. We really like that thing. You know, the robot stuff, we shot it in Jim's backyard. Jim built that robot. He's in the robot suit. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, we got Alan Stedman and uh, Phil Sampson shot it. And I was just there throwing Frisbees to him. And um, it was a really blast. It was a blast to make. And But I think it was it, it kind of it kind of drew off of old school Adult Swim, mm -hmm. you know. Like if we had made that tw fifteen years ago, we'd probably be on the air. Yeah, yeah. I but agree. they don't. Yeah, I don't, they're not looking for that anymore. They want they want just uh, stuff that's more broad and not as crazy. I I like the idea that you, as a part of Adult Swim, which was known for being crazy, like they are wanting to go more mainstream, for lack of a better term. So you had to go to Fox to make something weird like Postocalypse, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're kind of like switching a little bit. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, because this never would have happened at Adult Swim. Right, right. And it, it didn't even happen back when I pitched it. They were like, nah, we're not into uh, that. So I'm like, okay. Well, you know, I like, well, first of all, there's a there's an Amazon reference. We have the characters putting their, I think their feet are up on a box or something that says Amazon on mm -hmm. it. Which I love. Of yeah. course, you had Bento Box doing uh, Yinor. And uh, I just, I liked it because it wasn't like the kind of 11 minute animation we see today. And probably because, you know, you and Jim Fortier made it, but it's, it's 11 minutes, but there's almost like three acts to it. Like it, where it ends is so different from where it starts, but in a great way that like, that's what I love mm. about early Adult Swim stuff is it's just like, you never know where it's going to go. And like, by the end of, you know, they're like in these like colorful pants or, or, or chaps or whatever. It's like, what is happening? But it's like so enjoyable. So it's like, I know three other pilots aired that night too. I, I, I didn't see any of those, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you said they're not going to pick it up, which is a bummer because, you know, Aqua Teen would, would never have gotten <laughs> okayed. Not now. Right. They wouldn't now. That's for sure. And, uh, but yeah, I think, you was just a little too late. But we, we, I mean, Jim and I really liked that thing. We worked 
our asses off on it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, for anyone listening, it, you can watch it on Adult Swim's site for free. I'll put a link in the description. Um, I want to ask about Nunderworld. You were telling me about that yeah. last time we talked. Is there any development with that? Uh, not right now. We, we're out to a couple of buyers with it right now. Um, we're still waiting to sell it, basically. Okay. And it's it's pretty out of the box, too. Um but it, I think it's really unique, and it's it's our it's our version of a um, of a grindhouse cartoon. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of gore and stuff in it. It's it's almost like a pasta, but not nearly as silly as pasta. Uh, it has some good good dark moments. So we have it out to a number of outlets, and just kind of waiting to hear back. We did pitch it to Swim, and and they weren't interested in it. Um, uh, but that's okay. You know what? You, you get I get told no way more than I get told yes, though. When I hear no's, I'm like, okay, just move on to the next one. (laughs) Right, right. This lives in my head rent-free. I think about this from time to time. Just a nun with a stained glass window on her car is like so funny to me. (laughs) It's just like such a... Did I send you materials on it? Did I show you some stuff? No, I never saw anything, but you were were telling me about like a little bit about it last time we talked on the podcast. It's so killer. I'll send you the pitch deck just because I think you would enjoy the art. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it. Alex Party did the art. If you look him up, his stuff is um, just crazy. And he, uh, I know him, he used to come out to the ranch at Skywalker and just hang out because he was a big fan of Aqua Teen. And he, go, he goes to Comic-Cons and sells his stuff. He's really good. Um, and I wrote it with Ryan Gilmore. Mm-hmm. He made a movie called Murder in the Woods. And I met Ryan like five years ago. He had a pilot with John Cryer uh, called Mel from the Illuminati. And they brought me in to, to be on it with them. And that's how I met, met Ryan. The guy's amazing. So we put an underworld together. I think it came from. Uh, it originally started out as Necronunicon, and then we, <laughs> and then we had this idea. I know, but Underworld seemed to fit it better, and uh, we always liked the fact that somebody was slightly possessed. And I think it started out as a family, and the mom was slightly possessed. And I think it was going to be called M- Mom Necromomicon. Oh, that's what it was okay. originally. So it developed into Underworlds. So mm-hmm. Now we have. Yeah, she has a shotgun that shoots rosary beads, <laughs> and she has the shovel of Christ. <laughs> And, you know, and she's torn between being a goody, goody nun. And now she's also, also this demon. So um, it's really fucked up. Oh it's my funny. God, man. It's just, uh, yeah. I hope you guys can do that. That sounds so interesting. I hope so. so much, I hope like, so. Opportun- like so, so many opportunities to make that so great with just that idea alone is amazing. <laughs> and then I guess the last thing is, is there anything you've told us a bit, but is there anything you could tell us about the upcoming season of Aqua Teen? Oh, it's really good. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, we're, we're so proud of these episodes. We have some big names in them there. Uh, it, it was, I mean, it might've been kind of cool that we took a break because while it was easy to get back into it, I think these ideas are just larger than what we've ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're going to be powerful. Really good. Really good. There's some original music in it. Uh, Dave and I put together a couple songs and <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, you know, Floyd County's doing the animation now because, that's how it worked out and it's looking really great. There's some, yeah, it, it, they're really good episodes. I mean, like they're they're amazing. Can't wait for them to come out. I don't, I'm not sure when they're coming out. Brian Cox, Brian Cox is in one of our episodes. He was so amazing to, to see him on zoom. I'm like, you're on zoom in my house. (laughs) (laughs) What are you you doing in my house? And you're Lecter from Manhunter. Right. To me, he's always Manhunter. Uh, I never saw Succession. I know it's a great show. I mean, it's what I've been told, but I just I haven't seen it. Uh, you guys recently showed uh, like a pretty far along animatic for the Boston episode in Boston mm-hmm. on the twentieth. Yeah. My understanding is you didn't go to that. Yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't go to it. Uh, okay, because it said like in the pr- promotional material that like you were going to be there. I originally was going to be there. You know what? I had a I had an issue with making so much fun of it. To me, it's like there's an episode you can kind of hide behind and get it out there. But I felt like it was taking – this was just my assumption. And it, apparently, it went really well, and everybody loved it, and there was no no kind of backlash. But I didn't want to I didn't want to make fun of everybody in Boston because it was like – they were generally freaked out about it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of like it was funny after the fact, but like in a very shallow way. And I'm proud of the episode. It'll never be an episode, but it's what it is. So, yeah, I kind of – I slid out of it. I was gotcha. I didn't want to go and be like, you you people are stupid. You know what I mean? I just <laughs> but I think just fans showed up and Dave said it was 
that it really killed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of sad that it didn't go. But also, if I had gone, it would have been like fly in the day of and fly out at 5 a.m. Oh, yeah, screw that. Yeah. yeah. And I had a lot, really had a lot going on at the house at the end of school year. And well, plus Postocalypse came out that weekend. So I, I, I kind of thought too that did. you might be, you know, it busy with out. that. Yeah. It came out the day I was going to fly home right. if I had gone to Boston. Yeah. I was like, oh, how's that going to work? And then, uh, but yeah, I was like surprised because. Uh, luckily, nobody reached out to me about it, but I was like, yeah, you know, if you can go, you got to go because Matt Malero is going to be there and he never goes to things oh, like man. this. And then <laughs> I know. And I didn't go. I hardly do anything. You know, I hardly I, like I love going to Comic-Con because that to me is really fun. Um, I just I don't know why I avoid a lot of this stuff. I shouldn't. Now with pasta, I was trying to get it all day long, but there nobody was <laughs> listening to me. Oh. So. I did one interview with Bubble Blabber, you know, and that was it. They're like, oh, other people are going to say something. And I was like, well, you know, nobody did. It was fine. But it's like, I think the movie's doing really well on Tubi. And it has a lot of, a lot of people are liking it. So before I forget, I do want to say that I absolutely love the series of interviews that you did a couple months ago where <laughs> you're sitting there in the dark with sunglasses on and you've got like <laughs> a wig that's <laughs> like half on your head. I, I wanted to, to mention that because I just like, that's one of my favorite things that you guys have done when I see the, when yeah. I saw those. It was so good. We were doing that press junket and the only thing I didn't get to put on was my alien mask. <laughs> 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 it's so funny because Dave's always like, just there being just Dave. And I know he's looking at me like, why do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> why are you making this awkward for me? Because, I mean, the show we do is crazy. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to craze it up. Gotta, yeah. Have some fun with it. I feel like I feel like in the early years of Adult Swim, those kinds of interviews were more common, but you don't really see them as much anymore, I think. So I'm glad that you're keeping the spirit alive. And it, <laughs> it makes them so much more fun to watch, especially when the guys doing the interviews are like not trying to acknowledge it, really, yeah, at least from what we see. So you're just like looking like that. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Funny. And there were a couple <laughs> of those interviews. What was clearly just their, their uh, job for the day was to interview us and they had no idea Right, what right. The, who they were talking to, <laughs> what the show was. <laughs> How's that, huh? I got to say, I, I mentioned to Matt after the interview, I appreciate he's straight with me. He's He's got the lights on in his house. He doesn't have the wig on. He doesn't have the sunglasses on. But a little part of me is a little sad I'm not getting dunked on by Matt Malero. But, uh... So exciting to have him back on the podcast. Of course, I thought that Matt was one of those guys that I would never get on the podcast. But uh, as luck would have it, as life goes, he ends up being the first person to come back twice on the podcast, which I'm very, very grateful for. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And it was such a treat just to learn more about Postocalypse and, of course, the Aqua Teen DNA that it has. Now, I obviously don't want to take away from the film by constantly bringing up Aqua Teen, but that's kind of what we do here, and you can't really divorce the two. I mean, even Craig Harton was saying how the way that they would make Aqua Teen back in the day kind of informed how they're making these films now. So it's so great to see things full circle, and I do want to make clear that I really think this film stands on its own two legs, of course, without Aqua Teen, without that history attached to it. It's just a fun movie. I mean, Matt said that, that he just wanted to make something enjoyable. It doesn't have to have a heavy message or, or change your life. It just has to be enjoyable. And I hope you liked it too. Matt told us that he already wrote the second script and, and they're going through iterations of it. It's not approved for production yet, but it should be on the way, hopefully. And in Matt's Bubble Blabber interview, he mentions the name on that second film is set to be Post Alien Invasion, so get excited for that. I really liked, as always, how honest Matt was. I mean, he's never somebody to hold back. He was happy to go in on Tubi and Fox and their lack of promotion for this film. We actually talked a bit more about it, but I, I ended up cutting some things. I didn't want it to seem too much like a downer. For me, it was a little maybe cathartic to talk with Matt about this as somebody who was just shocked by how there was nothing about this movie coming out. And again, like I said, I was like, is it even coming out? I don't know. But luckily, it did. And to Fox's credit, to Tubi's credit, they made this thing that Adult Swim passed on. So, again, I mean, I, I want to be fair about this. They really took that chance. And as I said in the interview with Matt, it's crazy 
how he had to go to Fox to make this weird thing because it was like not mainstream enough or just not what Adult Swim wants these days. And even 10 years ago, that would have been insane. You'd be like, no way that would ever happen. But it's just nuts to me, especially Matt Malero being this Adult Swim OG. You know, he worked on Space Ghost before Adult Swim was a thing. And he had like his hand in all these early Adult Swim shows, Brack Show, C-Lab, Aqua Teen, of course. And now, all these years later, the things he's pitching are just too out there, I guess, for Adult Swim. It's times like these that I always go back to a quote from famous gangster rapper Bob Dylan. The times, they are a change, and but what is not changing is how just brilliant Matt is, how, how great of a guy he is, how fun he is to talk to. So really, thank you to Matt for taking the time to talk to us and, and let us into this process of making the film and also telling us all sorts of stuff about Aqua Teen too. It's always a pleasure, and let me tell you, if Matt became the first three-peat guest on this show, well, I wouldn't be mad about it. So that is it for me this week. Thank you, everyone who submitted questions for this one, especially Ian over at CorndogCentral.com for the 12-ounce mouse fans. I was very surprised because Ian's question was pertaining to a 2020 episode of 12 Ounce Mouse, this episode being Season 3, Episode 11, Final Beginning. And I have the screenshot, a link to it in the description if you want to see this early incarnation of Postocalypse. And fittingly, we have Mary Spender's character, Arya, standing in that screenshot as well. So thank you to Ian for submitting that question, because I had no idea, and I was surprised that Matt confirmed that, yes, this was like an original kind of idea for Postocalypse. So thank you to Ian and everyone else for submitting questions there. Thank you for listening. It's because of you listening that I get this opportunity to talk to just one of my childhood heroes and somebody who I just hold in the highest esteem. Thank you to our supporters of this show. This show is listener supported. So it's because of them that I get to keep really making this show. You know, making it isn't free and they allow me to keep doing it. If you're new here, I should mention that normally on this show, what we do is go through every episode of Aqua Teen. I bring up all sorts of facts and info from the commentaries, from research, and from asking the guys directly myself. I have other interviews with, of course, Matt, but but Dave Willis, J. Wade Edwards, MC Chris, uh, many more, many more great interviews, and there are many more to come this year. Check that out if you're interested, but... Uh, I'm not going to lie, the only way I could get Matt on the show is he had such a high from shouting out our top tier supporters in his last appearance. The only way he would come back is if I let him do it again. So after six months of negotiation, we got the paperwork done. Matt, take it away. All right, guys. It's Matt Malero from Aqua Teen, Postocalypse. I'm going to give a shout out to Nick, Sean, Ian, Captain Buford, Robeson. Did I say that right? Robison. Robison. I said it wrong last time. Sorry about that, <laughs> Robison. Jason Carl, Lachey Raton 69, clearly from Louisiana, and Empower 706. You guys are fucking cool. bought this one because it has a floyd rose and humbucker oh, pickups oh nice yeah, yeah yeah and i played this i opened up for the foo fighters with this band in st louis and i i used this guitar really when, when was that uh god that was probably in 2011 2012 something like that gotcha w was that with year-long disaster was that the yeah band? yeah i met them through somebody said these guys really love the show they want you to make their video i think you know that story yeah and so i yeah so then I started playing a lot of stuff with them. So I flew to London with them and we um, technically opened up for ACDC at download. <laughs> oh, oh man, that's great. That's awesome. That's like, it's like one of your favorite bands. Yeah. Yeah. We're like one of like 300 bands that opened up for ACDC. Yeah, right hey man, that's, I mean, I, I know like you're, you're downplaying it, but I mean, most bands have not opened up for ACDC. So that's, <laughs> that's not nothing. We got kicked out of, we, we wandered over to their base camp. And there's a massive bus for each member of the, their band. And they weren't there, but they had all the good food, the lobster and the, all just everything. And we had badges that we'd like, we're just going to go over here. We we're hanging out and like, it didn't take five minutes for somebody to come over and say, <laughs> you're out of here. <laughs> 
hey, it's Ronnie coming in after the fact. I was actually able to track down an audience recording of Matt and Year Long Disaster opening for ACDC at Download Festival 2010. Link in the description.